our lesson for September the 25th, 2016. Uh, this is out of Unit 1, The Sovereignty of God. The lesson is Lesson 4, and our title is Reliable Promises. Our devotional reading is Isaiah, the 42nd chapter, verses 5 through 9. Our background scripture is Isaiah 61, and our printed passage is Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 4, and also verses 8 through 11. And our key verse is Isaiah 61, uh, verse 8. In the King James Version, it reads, I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offerings, and I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Our lesson's aims are, know that God has high ethical standards and enters into secure and enduring covenants with people. Appreciate what it means to live justly and faithfully according to God's covenant expectations. And prepare a statement of human response to God's covenant that reflects life today. Now at the onset of our lesson, I would like to read the biblical context uh, just to create the background and the um, just to set the tone of the lesson and how it is presented and what time and against what type of conditions in the society at that time. The biblical context states, Isaiah prophesied during the time in Israel's history when the divided kingdoms were experiencing both political and spiritual decline. Now we need to look at, there is uh, two encounters that Israel is experiencing here, but there is a condition that brought about these consequences. And that condition is that the nation was divided. And the enemy loves division. The scripture tells us that a house that is divided cannot stand. But one of the strategies of the enemy is to divide and conquer. And so because Israel was divided, it said they were experiencing both political and spiritual decline. Now, this was centered around the time that the northern kingdom was in Samaria. And at that point, uh, in Samaria, they were suffering from political, spiritual, and military deterioration. And finally, they succumbed to the military might of a foreign empire, a foreign military power, the Assyrian Empire in 722 B.C., but let's read further. The southern kingdom of Judah was seemingly facing the same fate, but they were miraculously delivered by divine intervention. Uh, this should be read in the second Kings, uh, the 19th chapter and verse 35. And you may be familiar with this, but uh, during the time when Isaiah was prophesying to Judah, uh, they were afraid of the Assyrians because they had heard about how notorious the Assyrians were and how powerful their army and all was. And they prayed unto the Lord, and here is how the Lord responded. And again, this is 2 Kings nineteen thirty-five, And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were corpses all dead. 
when the Lord decides that the Lord will do work, the Lord delivers. So as we engage into the study of our lesson, right at the onset, at the beginning, we want to declare this because the title of the lesson is Reliable Promises. So in the 23rd chapter of Numbers, it reads, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and he will not do? Or has he spoken and he will not make it good? Also, in addition to that, we also want to read 2 Corinthians, the first chapter and verse 20, where it says, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. So when we begin to talk about the scripture today, and talk about the promises that are lifted in the text. We should be mindful of the fact that we are not talking about political leaders or religious leaders. We're not talking about presidents and we're not talking about CEOs and we're not talking about leaders of organizations. We are talking about God. And just as the scripture has told us, when God says something, we can put faith and trust in that because God is not a entity. God is not an organization. God is not a political party. God is sovereign. God is the self-created one. God is ruler over all creation. So we don't have to wonder whether or not God could be persuaded, if God could be bought off, if God might have forgot, or any of those human characteristics. When God speaks, it is so. So let's enter into our lesson under that pretense. Now we have something else also in our lesson that is very significant. And I'm reading from the NIV. But as we start through verses 1 through 3 of Isaiah 61, it starts off with uh, a very essential yet divine element that was present on our Lord Christ Jesus uh, when he opened the book in the temple and began to preach in the synagogue. Here it is in Isaiah, and it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Not bad news, not terrible news, but good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to gather and assemble the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, not a continuation of suppression or oppression. And when we're speaking here of freedom, we're not just talking about freedom from physical bondage, but we're talking about real freedom, the freedom of mind and spirit. And it says, and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. Now, I want to stop right there to uh, highlight something here in that second verse when we speak of to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. There is a distinction 
uh, in this same text recorded in Isaiah 61 and in Luke, the fourth chapter. In Isaiah, in the second verse, it says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. But if we read over in Luke, the fourth chapter, we will notice that Christ, as he is reading it and explaining his mission and his ministry and what he was sent to do. When we look at this, we'll notice that when he gets to the part about proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord, the text says in the 20th verse of Luke, the fourth chapter, after the reading of the 19th, the beginning of that 19th verse, which is in the beginning of the second verse in Isaiah 61, when he finishes reading the acceptable year of the Lord, it says, and he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And that was because Christ stopped at the point of what he was sent to accomplish. Again, we're talking about the reliable promises of God. He stopped at what he was sent to accomplish in his first visit among mankind. But he knew that the day of vengeance had not yet come and that he was not getting ready to fulfill that in his first visit among mankind, but that he would fulfill it. So it was not, I said that he had not yet fulfilled it, but I didn't say that he wasn't going to fulfill it. For scripture tells us in the 19th chapter of Revelations, uh, if we start at the 11th verse and read forward, uh, we then find uh, what Christ was speaking of on his second coming. And this is why he did not finish what was recorded in Isaiah because he knew that his day of vengeance upon the earth and upon mankind was not coming in his first visit, but that would be in his second coming. So for those that want to read the distinction between these two similar, very similar scriptures, one recorded in Isaiah and the other in Luke, uh, read into Revelations, starting at the 11th verse and on through to the end of that chapter. And it will give a lot more clarity into why Christ in Luke didn't read the day of vengeance yet. Now, when others read of the promises of God, um, one of the things that uh, we should note is, is that these are God's promises. These are not the promises of those who have been subjected to cruelty, to mistreatment, uh, to all types of uh, misfortunes at the hands of another ruling people. But these are the fulfillments of God's promises. And so the later in the scripture, we're going to uh, lift a point from the uh, sixth uh, verse in Isaiah, where it speaks about the condition or it speaks of the uh, spiritual setting of those whom God had redeemed and their interaction with members of the group that was oppressive and how this new peopling, all being anointed by the Spirit of God, 
how, why then there should not be a fear of retaliation from this new spirit that God has placed in the hearts of his people who choose to follow the teachings and the spirit and the will of God above that of themselves. Now, while that transition and that transformation is taking place, those that are being caught up in that transition needs to also remember that retaliation is coming on those who were the suppressors, the aggressors, and the oppressors. So while one is being transformed, another one is being Another one is fulfilling the promises of God. Now I can, I can take care of Leonard. I can subject myself to the will of God. And I can beg for forgiveness for the ill thoughts of my own mind. I can change my own behavior by submitting to God's will. But what is between you and God, that is between you and God. Now let's read on further. The third verse says, and provide for those who grieve in Zion. Now Zion was a, uh, uh, the city of David. It was for the return. It was uh, thought of as the house of God, that God dwelled there, that this was the city of God. And so when people were being restored, they would want to gather at the city of God to be in homage with God and to show respect and recognition and recognize that God had brought them out, that God had restored them. So when they say to provide for those who grieve in Zion, when Zion, when the city was captured, then it says to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy, instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now, when we look at this, we're speaking of Christ, the servant redeemer. And it says that he will give them a new name, a tree of righteousness, symbolically referring to those strong in righteousness who would bring glory to God. So as people are being brought out and redeemed and restored, their mindset has changed. A lot of times when you find yourself uh, in trouble and you find yourself uh, in the consequences of evil and wickedness and such, the last thing that you want to do is go right back into it. You don't want to repeat. You want freedom from it. You want to forget about it. You want to move on. You want a new start. You want to think of how you came out of it, who preserved you while you were in it. So your thought process is different. So when we start talking about how this uh, promise is being fulfilled, look at what the text is telling us. And it says, now we're reading on into the fourth, and it says, they will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Now, a lot of times when division takes place among a nation, things go uh, unkept. 
resources dry up, sometimes deliberately and on purpose. And then uh, certain communities uh, show the strife and the neglect because a nation is divided. But here, what the text is saying is, is that when the servant redeemer comes, that his purpose is to restore these areas that have been devastated for so long. So we're still speaking of the promises of God, not of man, not of governments, not of economic programs, but we're speaking of God's intervention in the hearts of his people. Now, it goes on to tell us that the Lord said that he loves justice, but he hates robbery for offerings, burnt offerings. Now, here we have a contrast. And sometimes people get caught up into rituals and they believe that they can cover up their evil and wicked doings by practicing certain religious rituals. So they can do wrong to themselves. They can do wrong to members of their family. They can, they can mistreat people uh, in other parts and other groupings and settings. But as long as they come to the temple, and they provide a offering in accordance with the demands of religious structure. Well, all is forgiven. But God says he is not a fool. That he can't be misled. He can't be manipulated. Uh, you can't pull a blanket over his eyes as though he doesn't see your real intent. So it says that. That he would reward his people. He would do this out of his own faithfulness. And I like the way that the word is read in the King James Version. Where it says, I will direct their work in truth. And I will make with them an everlasting covenant. Now, in the NIV, it says, in my faithfulness, I will reward my people. But I like where it says, and I will direct their work in truth. Because many times it is lies and misinformation and misdirection that leads us into these crooked paths. I like the fact that in the King James, the text says in truth, not in misnomers and, and not in second hand and word of mouth and, you know, around the corner and up the block. But in truth, I will direct them. And I want to attach to that as uh, I get ready to bring this here to a close. At the end of the uh, fourth verse, verses five through seven are not printed in the text, but verse six has a certain significance to it that I think should be lifted. And in Isaiah, the 61st chapter, verse six says this, but you shall be named the priest of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles and in their glory you shall boast. Now, I want to speak of this because it's actually explaining or identifying the character of the people who have been redeemed. And it says that you shall be named the priest of the Lord. Now, 
when someone is received a position of honor of that type, their attitude is different. A lot of people look for uh, folks to retaliate, to remember when, and to uh, visit upon them all the things that they've done to someone else. But I want to lift this about those who have not been redeemed by a government or not been redeemed by a company that stole their pension plans and such as that. But no, I'm talking about people who have been redeemed and convicted and compelled by the spirit of God. Now, when they are looked upon, as it says in verse six, that they would be named the priest of the Lord. That brings on a different mindset. A lot of people look at that as just that, that oh, now they're going to be exalted. Now they're going to be privileged. Uh, but here it says their exalted position is not one of privilege, but of responsibility to teach the strangers the Lord's way. So as we close to the end of our lesson and we didn't go through all of the verses but as you read on from verse uh, 9 on through 10 it gives a lot of parallels about uh, things that were denied and how now these things would be awarded to those who've been redeemed by the work of the servant redeemer by Christ these are the promises of God fulfilled in his son and even on the return of his son. So uh, make ourselves, let's get ourselves prepared. Let's open up our own hearts. Let's open up our own minds and our spirits so that we can be the vehicles that God wants to uh, place to be examples and to once again be lights in the world of darkness that all people would see the mighty work of God in us and see God's will and see God's way and then glorify our Father in heaven. As always, we hope that something we have said through the lesson will benefit those who are the hearers. But most importantly, let us not just be hearers of the word, but doers as well. God bless.